Dan Quinn is our guest today. Dan is with Rapala. Oh, I always say Rapala. Is it a Southern thing, Dan? Because I know it's really supposed to be Rapala, isn't it? Officially, it is Rapala, but it's definitely a regional deal. And the adage kind of goes, say it however you want, as long as you buy them. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to try really hard to say Rapala, but it's it's really difficult for me. Um, Dan is a promotions manager, right? Field promotions. What What is your official title? Yeah, I would. Yeah, field promotions manager, which is a unique title. And I wear lots of hats, but um, that is my title. And yes. so what does that mean? What is what is a promotions manager for somebody as if somebody was from another planet? Explain what that means. Ultimately, I manage our pro staff. So both the, the big name national level bass pros to walleye pros to regional uh, guides um, yeah. all over the country from Alaska to New York to Florida to Minnesota. And that's so pro staff is a really broad term, but also all of our media partners. So the, the companies and TV shows. Oh, wow. Um, any sort of media entity, basically. And then a lot of the endemic media some of the higher profile guys a lot of the guys at bass um that need a you know a guy who knows the 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 industry and the fishing and the pros really well so i'll coordinate interviews with our pro staff and kind of be the representative for rapala do a lot of different orchestrate a lot media events and filming and things like that so So it's a really fun job I mean, I, I'm sure it is a really fun job, and I, I envy you. You, I think your company is an incredible place. Um, the people that I know that I've been lucky enough to get close to over the years are just, just some, some of the night. Honestly, some of the nicest people I've ever met, and um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm sure you realize you're one of them. But I'm sure you realize how um, what a blessing that is. And um, you know, people always say that Southerners are nice, but um, man, mm-hmm. Minnesotans. There's a reason why they say Minnesota nice, and um, you guys, <laughs> you guys, almost take it a little that. too far. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I understand. So, okay, so yeah, how'd you I get into this, that. Dan? I, I I looked on your LinkedIn. What is Mills Fleet? Mills, you know, I'm really bad with LinkedIn. I probably haven't opened that up. <laughs> in a what, long what, so, what's time. your background? How'd you get into it? So what that was, Mills Fleet Farm is a store in the Midwest that sells fishing tackle. They sell clothes. They sell farming equipment. It's really, it's like they call it the man's mall. It's just kind of, you know, duct tape and power tools, whatever. Yeah. And it's a really popular chain up here. And the reason I work there, I caught shoplifters. So I went to school for um, criminal justice, a four-year degree. And then I went into the police academy. And went through that, and my hopes were to be a game warden. Oh, really? Yep. So that's. And then kinda, how did yeah. how did that evolve to uh, Rapala? Well, basically, I went through the police academy and went went through lots and lots of application processes to be a police officer to get some experience, which would then lead into being a game warden, conservation mm-hmm. officer. It's very difficult to land a job as a police officer, or it was at that time. I'm guessing right now it's probably not as hard, but I got the job with Fleet Farm to catch shoplifters, interacting with the police department, and so on and so forth. A good stepping stone. Um, all the while, my passion in life has always been fishing. And I, I, I grew up with my dad working at In Fisherman, and I, in eighth grade, I was working at In Fisherman, eighth grade oh. all the way through college. So I'd already had almost 10 years of experience in the fishing world, and I never even, it never even dawned on me. But as I worked for Fleet Farm and caught shoplifters, I enjoyed it. But I, I lost interest in the law enforcement angle and just kind of, you know, went through a little bit of a period talking to my dad. Dad, what, I don't know what, you know, what can I do in the fishing world? And oddly enough, it's funny that as we talked, I ran it. They had the last professional walleye trail tournament in Hudson, Wisconsin, where I'd moved. And that's what I worked for through in Fisherman, the professional walleye trail. So as I'm helping them out with their very last championship in Hudson, where I'd moved to, and I hadn't been working with them much as of late, as I'd been trying to get into law enforcement, I met a guy by the name of Greg Walner. Oh, man. He went behind some fences and was kind of snooping around. And I had to go say, excuse me, we, you know, we need to keep you over here. 
And he said, oh, I'm Greg Walner. And I said, oh, great to meet you, so on and so forth. But funny but you story. you still got to get on the other side. <laughs> You're Greg Walner, but you still have to be on the other side of the fence, please. <laughs> right. And I know you know Greg really well, so it's kind of funny. But long story short, I came to realize he's a vice, pre- you know, vice president of Rapala. And I it just kind of like, it just kind of hit me like, man, that's that's a company I should really check into. And long story short, his neighbor was a friend of mine who was fishing in the tournament. And I had recently moved to Hudson. So I met met up with my friend and he said, I've got a neighbor that wants to buy a fish house, which I don't know if you know what a fish house is, but yeah. up here there, you know, it's a cabin on wheels with holes in the floor and you bring it out on a frozen lake. So Greg wanted to buy that. And I got kind of looped in with these guys and helped be a partner in it and move it around to keep it on fish. And just talking with Greg, getting to know Greg more. And I got kind of got my foot in the door with Rapala. Mm -hmm. And this was my dream job, but going into it, there's not much turnover. So they eventually had a customer service position open and I jumped at the chance to get that and kind of prove myself that I'm committed to the company. I'm competent, so on and so forth. And within a year, this job opened miraculously and they chose me for it and the rest is history. So, yeah. well, um, you know, that's a great take home lesson for anybody out there listening. You know, you don't always start your career where you want to be right. You, you can start anywhere. You can find a little niche to work your way in. Agreed. A hundred percent because I actually, to take it one step back, I went into college to get into herpetology. Oh my gosh. Which is maybe not what you think it is. It's yeah. actually the study <laughs> of reptiles and amphibians. And I quickly realized that I'm interested in those critters. It's more of a hobby, not yeah. a profession. So <laughs> I think you're much I think you're much better off doing what you're doing now. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how it worked out like this, but it did. And I'm very thankful and fortunate and truly love my job. Um, it's a cool, unique job and, um, with a great company. So, yeah. And Greg Walner is no longer with Rapala. He works in another sort of related industry, but, uh, one of the smartest men that I've known in the fishing industry, uh, personally, and a, a brilliant, brilliant guy, really smart about a lot of different things. And, um, I imagine it was a, he was a good person to, to, to work with. I, I imagine you learned a lot from him, didn't you? I absolutely. I, I, oh, getting a job with Rapala to Greg. He's he's still a great friend. We don't talk nearly as often as I'd like to, but he lives probably four or five miles from me. We're just at, you know, different yeah. stages in life. I've got little kids and things, but no, Greg is, boy, I really respect and admire Greg. He's a really great human being and really smart. Right. I do enjoy spending time with him. He was and a great I, leader for our company. Honestly, I think everybody I've met at Rapala embodies those same qualities. It's just amazing how the DNA of that company has been, you know, that, it's a testament to good leadership that the, everybody that I know sort of has some of the, some of those same same qualities. And that's that's what you want, right? That's what you want in a company. It is. No, I, I really appreciate that. And I, I agree. It's um, when you have a lot of great culture at a workplace right. like that. And people get excited about new products. It's contagious and it, yeah. it helps, you know, everyone has a passion for it. And not everyone's as passionate about actually catching a fish, but they're passionate about the business and want us to be successful. And um, it's fun. It's a yeah. great company to work for. Yeah, awesome. Really awesome. Okay. We're going to take a little short break and then we're going to come back with Dan Quinn, the promotions manager. I hope I've said that right. Promotions manager at Rapala. Be right back. Hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, check out fishingbusinessschool.com where you can see video uploads of the podcast as well as my blog where I give you more practical advice on the business side of fishing. Fishingbusinessschool.com. Come see me over there. We're back on the Fishing Business Podcast. I'm Angie Thompson. My guest today is Dan Quinn with Rapala. I said it right. I'm from the South. I always say Rapala. I don't know why. It's just a thing. I can't say it's so hard for me to say Rapala. But Rapala is actually owned by a parent company, the parent company Normark, which is uh, Swedish. Is it a Swedish company, Dan? Uh, Finnish. Finnish. Yeah, we're based out of Finland. And that's a big, uh, fishing's a big deal over there. Very big deal. 
Yeah. Yeah. Rapala is a really cool company in the, in the historical sense mm-hmm. that started with a guy hand carving a lure out of a piece of wood and wrapping a candy wrapper around it. I mean, the, the history runs deep with Rapala in Finland. And yeah, the fishing history of in Finland is, is really neat. And I, I got the chance to go there a few years ago and it was it was just the coolest trip I've ever been on. So it's truly a global global company. And as you know, as you're part of your marketing job, you're appealing to people all over the world, not just in the United States, right? You know, that absolutely. It's that's one of the interesting things about Rapala. And you know, they're we are a very large company and we're global. And what's cool about that is we we make fishing lures for situation fishing situations and environments and different species all over the world right. you know we aren't we make great lures for catching largemouth and smallmouth bass in in alabama but we also make great lures that catch barramundi in australia or it. xander in europe um trout in russia it, it's it's cool to see and, and some of the the real hero lures we have are are lures that catch fish everywhere when yeah. it all stems back to to a minnow shaped lure, the original floater that lure well, Rappler carved in 1936. But and the cool thing about that is you can kind of synthesize all of that fishing knowledge from all over the world and put it into something that can work that works in Alabama. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Fish are fish; they like right. to eat other fish, and Love ultimately, it. that's. That's where it all started, and that's where we're, where we're still doing today. So it's it's cool. It's a really cool story and history and company. So what does set what in your mind? What sets Rapala apart from other from other tackle brands? You know, it's hard to to top that one that yeah. we we play in that many markets. We have yeah. distribution in. That's it then. Uh, quote me, don't quote me. Twenty seven countries around wow. the world. I mean, it's it, when you start thinking about the the various fisheries and environments and markets that that Rapala is in mm-hmm. it's it's really mind blowing from you know cart markets and markets in Australia obviously um the US is our is our biggest market and that's where we have a lot of focus on the bass market and the walleye right. market but um the diversity the diversity of Rapala and all of our brands that we have underneath our umbrella of Normar um i think is what is cool and separates Rapala from other companies. Not to mention that that most of our lures are made of balsa, which is ah. a, a very difficult wood to work with and make consistent fishing lures. Yet that's our definite. I mean, that's that's what Rapala is all about. Is our balsa fishing lures? Love that. Love that. Okay, so what is the relationship like? You tell me more about what the relationship is like, because because I have my own observations over the years, uh, the relationship between the Rapala brand and its sponsored anglers. So the relationship with Rapala and the, the anglers basically is that is ultimately my job. And I'm in a, I'm fortunate to be in the position that I'm in where I definitely have lots of responsibilities, but that's that's one of the big ones for me. Mm-hmm. and. I guess it it works out well. I'm a pretty easy guy to get along with and I know enough about fishing and we have, I have a really good relationship with all the guys I work with. Like, I mean, I, they're really, they're, they're my friends and some of them are my very good friends and we talk, virtually every day so that was my that's my observation as I've as I've seen I guess I, as you know I, through my career I've seen a lot of different fishing brands and, and a lot of different pros be sponsored by different people the the thing I always noticed and, and was envious about with Rapala is it always seemed like y'all were genuinely friends and like almost family it felt like the brand felt like these guys were their family. They weren't just paid shills to go out and try to help them say, sell something. It was, it felt like family. That's, that's really cool to hear because that it's, that's truly how it is. Um, you know, and I talk with them, I know them all well enough to say that the relationship we do have is unique. It's not the norm. And I think it, it, it's a real benefit to Rapala. It's hard for a lot of companies maybe to justify having someone like me there, but, relationships yeah. are what is the are they the foundation of the fishing industry that's right. how you maximize your your reach and your leverage with things and it's 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 all about relationships and have a good solid relationship with your 
pro staff that we invest a lot of money into is is hugely important. I think if you don't have that and it's just a paycheck deal, you just don't get the passion and the enthusiasm and the, the full maximum support you could out of these guys. There's just no way. Okay, well then, does it make it really hard then to hire new people? Because you take a big risk, right? You, if, what, if you, what if you bring a new person onto the pro staff and they don't fit the family? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's interesting how it's where it was when I took it over and where it is today and how the guys kind of blend together. Um, it's not a perfect family, but, it, but I treat them as individuals. The, ultimately, they are kind of our, a team to us. Um, you know, I always, I talk to most every one of them about a potential guy that I'm thinking about adding. Yeah. Um, and if, if I got a lot of negative feedback, certainly I would have, yeah. you know, second thoughts about it all. But I, I, I really, I study this stuff. So I kind of have a very direct avenue to who I want to add to the pro staff. And I, I guess it kind of, what I look for is the credibility and I want nice guys. I want good people, good, yeah. good values. So that, with that, I've never had an issue, I guess. So how do you, when you study it, let me ask you this. How do you, do you watch people on, do you, do you follow people? And if you're thinking about adding someone, do you follow them on social media? How do you find out more about them? How do you find out if they're really a good guy and, and part, you know, would, would, would fit? So that's, yeah, it's changed in the maybe not even 10 years I've been doing this. It started, I would be, I would attend a lot of tournaments and mm -hmm. I would just kind of casually mill around and just interact with the guys I work with, but also just kind of be a fly on the wall here and there. And you, you really get a sense of who's, what people are all about when they don't know anyone's watching. Right. So that's where, it, that's kind of how it used to be. And, I, and I, I'll, I'll ask the guys I work with, you know, do you, you know, what do you think of this guy or anybody, an up and comer that you've noticed? Um, so they, they provide me a lot of good intel. Um, but now it has definitely social media has changed that quite a bit where you can yeah. kind of spy on people. From yeah, that's right. That's um, right. That's and, what I tell people all the time. I'm like, man, you need to be think, you know, you think you're just posting into your feed, but you're posting, you know, everybody can see what you're talking about and, and, and people, want, oh, yeah. you know, everybody wants to, uh, just be careful with that is what I'm saying. You know, it's gotten a lot, it's gotten some people in trouble and it's been very, very good for others. So, um, you have to just be careful with how you, cause it's your brand. It's your personal brand is what's going on your social media feed. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's, it's amazing where it is today and how big of a deal it can be, you know, right. for a lot of guys at a more regional level, you know, until it hits a certain point, it's not all that valuable. I don't think to a company, but, but, it, but it, it's a factor regardless, but ultimately you get, you know, some of our top tier guys like Jacob Wheeler, Iconelli, yeah. Gerald or Brandon, boy, their social media is a huge part of what they bring and right. they can, you know, influence the market, influence sales through their, their strategic way of how they run their channels and post and help you sell products and market yeah. products in a in their way. And everyone does it differently, which is right. kind of cool to see that everyone yeah. has their own deal going and there's no right way or wrong way. But we're, and we're actually glad everybody does it different because that makes it, that's what makes it interesting. Okay. In the overall marketing mix at your company. So you have print ads, you have television shows, you have digital ads. How important is the sponsorship piece of marketing to the overall marketing mix? Your sponsorship of athletes. It's, it's important. We have a, a good sized portion of our marketing budget is, is earmarked and dedicated to pro staff. It always mm -hmm. has been, and we have no plans to change that. Um, obviously, at the, the current time we're dealing with, things are in flux. We, mm -hmm. we may have a little bit of a downturn, but ultimately, we're going to be right back to where we were. Yeah. And that's, they, they play a big part in, in our in-store promotions, whether it's, it's signage in stores. We want to use our, our, you know, promote our anglers, put their mm -hmm. faces on you know, ads in magazines on digital, you know, just they play a big part because they help get our message out. These guys yeah. have dedicated their life to fishing and fishing tournaments often and gaining that credibility. So they're a trusted person to the consumers. Um, so that's, 
Yeah, if it's a message from Rapala, you know, obviously Rapala is going to tell you that everything they make is great and good. Just like if you're going to go buy a truck, Ford's going to tell you. But you want to have some some people outside of there talk, telling your story too, and and leveraging their fan base and things like that. Right. So they're a big big part of what we do with marketing. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, um, and we just talked about it a little bit, but you know, then, the, then those anglers, their social media becomes kind of almost an extension of your social media where you can push that message down through to consumers, right? Their platforms are a big part of what they offer to us yeah. to, to help, you know, I, I like, I like things to be done fairly organically and not push mm-hmm. and, and direct them as much. I like them to put their own spin on things and, let things happen more naturally. I think it appeals more to the consumers and their fan base. And then they all agree with me on that. So we kind of let things happen, but their platform is a big deal that like, I mean, just Gerald Swindle, the, right. the pull he has on the, the the core bass market in Alabama is, is incredible. And, and a lot of that is his social media. He's very active. He's dedicated to growing that and building it and being active on it. And, it's a huge thing. It's a huge, yeah. it's a huge and part of his, what he does. And his social media is not all about fishing. It's not all about the latest product or it's not all selling. It's, he's got a wide variety of, of content that he pushes out that lets people get to know him and, and like him and trust him. 100%. I think the most successful guys on social media, they have, they, they know how to navigate that. They don't, a hard sale doesn't work to, to people. People don't want to be told what to buy. They want to naturally have, be curious about it or, or believe someone telling them this is such a great way to catch fish, so on and so forth. But it's not always selly, selly. It's just people want to kind of know who you are. And yeah. and it's just the whole, it's an entertainment thing. It's like a, you know, yeah, a reality TV, but some some element of Really it getting is, to know people. Yeah, it is the reality of your of your life, really. And um, I mean, I I think that's what's so so cool about social media is you can um, you know, you can get a glimpse into because you 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 know there might be people out there that think, man, I would love to be a professional angler, and and it's a bed of roses, and boy, they've got the life, and it's easy, and they're living on easy street. But then when you really follow some of these guys, you realize it's. It's not all easy street, but it's it's still aspirational, and it's you and you're inspired by it, and you, you know, and you want to you want to know more about it because if, even though it's not easy, you still think it would be pretty dang cool. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, <laughs> people definitely get a lot more insight into what these guys actually do than they ever have, and right. I think every day there's more and more insights into that. Because ten years ago, you know, there were articles in Bassmaster, and there were you know videos here and there, but it. People had no idea. They really looked glamorous and easy and right. fun. But now right. people are, those these guys work so hard. I mean, they they travel like carnies, and yeah. they're just you know how they stay positive and and you know they're eating dinner, getting interrupted like constantly. Yeah. That that type of stuff they deal with. It's it's admirable. It's an it's impressive. It really is. Okay, so so let's take one of those guys, or or uh, hypothetically, because we're, we're talking about we were talking about not sell, but not being selly selly all the time. But um, what is your dream guy, your dream angler? What does he do on stage? Not the Bassmaster Classic, not uh, you know, not a major TV event, but you know, a, a weekend regional tournament. What does your guy do on on stage that is perfect in your wheelhouse for you? How does he talk about your product? I guess it would be as organic as possible and it would be genuine. Mm -hmm. So what, when things are really working with, with Rapala and an angler or any company and a sponsored angler is they're actually genuinely using your product and they're passionate about it and they have faith and confidence in it that say they won a tournament and they're, you know, there's a few dozen people out there that are listening to them. I would hope that, and it doesn't always happen like this, but that they use one of our products and they can say that, you know, the re- I caught these fish with this lure and, and just be very straightforward, not, not over the top, but just factual that, hey, I caught all these fish on this lure and this color, tell people exactly what it was. Yeah. And what, what's interesting with that is you get that type of um, dialogue out of a fisherman that's 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 visiting a lake 
that they may not come back for five years versus a guy that lives there and fishes regionally. He's probably going to fish that lake in two weeks right? in a month. So there's, a, it's interesting that guys at a regional level are, are pretty tight lipped and I get it. I understand it because I fish tournaments myself and I don't want to tell everybody yeah. <laughs> what it gets them on, but you know, there's kind yeah. of a balance that, that, and that, to that, that's why a guy that travels and fishes on a national level is more valuable to a company. And that's, yeah. and here's some negativity about guys saying, oh, these guys ha- eat up all the money, but ultimately those, the bigger the name, the bigger the platform, the more product they can help market and sell. So, but ultimately that guys have to get started somewhere. Well, and and what I always tell uh, when I'm coaching guys, what I tell them is you got to remember that the person that's there watching is there for himself. He's, he's trying to learn something from you. So if you can, you know, if you can tell him something, if you can teach him something about his lake or, or, if you, you know, or, or any lake, um, put yourself in his shoes. And, and if you can wrap that around into um, something more than this is what I caught and this is how I caught it, you know, just this is the bait I used and this is the weight I caught. If you can wrap it into a bigger story that helps teach them, then, then that guy's going to remember you probably. And you've done him a good service and you've done your sponsor a good service. Yeah, especially if it's something kind of a different spin on something that people aren't as familiar with. Like our new, we've got a new Tokyo rig through VMC that's been really amazingly popular and it's catching on. And, and when people talk about it on a, in a regional level and p- people may have not have any experience with it, right. they go to use it and have a positive experience. Well, that that's a big deal. And that really, ex- you know, extends through the grassroots and that's what's yep. happened with that particular rig. And a lot of guys have helped us do that that's without cool. any, a lot of national exposure. That's it's kind of a cool, cool story. To yeah, I love that. love that. And that's with v, that's a VMC brand product. Yes, yes. Gotcha. And VMC actually owns Rapala. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, gotcha. It does. Uh, so, okay, so now tell me about, you've been there 10 years, is that what you said? Just about, yeah, Just nine for there. sure. So what? tell me about a transformation you've seen a pro go through in your time there to, um, you know, to, to, to get better or, or to uh, just some sort of transformation that you've seen it happen. Yeah. Um, because we all evolve, right? 100%. And it's interesting. I can't say that every single guy I've, I work with has gone through this, nor have I been with them their whole entire career. But ultimately a lot of guys that I've seen start from the very beginning mm-hmm. and to get to where they are now, which it would, the uh, super high profile guy. Um, they seem to all go through a period where they need money, which uh-huh. is fairly normal and expected. Yeah. So they're willing to accept a lot of deals for maybe not tons of money, but a lot of, you know, two or $5,000 deals. And that every deal they, they accept requires their time for some promotional days, whether it's seminars or sports shows they need to attend on for that sponsor's behalf. But they also consume their the, the space on their jerseys, their logos on their trucks, logos on their boats. Mm-hmm. The more they get of that, the less value they're giving to each one of them, especially the bigger ones who maybe really stepped out to support them at a, at a title sponsorship level. Right. So, I mean, I remember talking with Brandon when he was, you know, he just had so many sponsors. It was his jersey just was like, wow, very, really yeah. cluttered. He and he, I kind of like guys to have the epiphany on their own. Right. Where they realize I'm better off to part ways with some of these. I, I don't have the time. I don't yeah. have the time for everybody, let alone the big ones that are really supporting me that I'm, I'm providing less value to them as they want to grow with me. So, I've seen multiple guys have that epiphany where they realize, boy, this isn't the way to go. I need to invest my time in these bigger ones where I can grow and have less sponsors and keep my dollars, you know, at a manageable level, but reduce my time with all these, you know, side deals. Kind of. But you can get just stretched too thin. You have, you have too many obligations to too many people and you don't have enough resources to do a good job for anyone. hundred percent. Yeah. Because, 
I'm like, you know, I might say, well, we're going to have a photo shoot on these dates. And they say, well, yeah, I can't do it because I got to do this or I got to right. do that. And then he said, well, how about this date? No, I can't do this. So eventually the guys being available is a really big deal. Yeah. For me, yeah. especially with maybe it's with lures, but we have product development going. We have, you know, there's just a lot of things we want to get done, video shot. And, and I, the more available a guy can be, the better, the more so- valuable they are for the company. So you need a guy to um, be available for photo shoots for for your creative collateral. You need uh, you you need speaking engage. You need personal appearances, right? You do send them out to retail to do personal appearances, that sort of thing. Yeah, which and I get it. It's a double edged sword. The the busier a guy is, well, the more active he is, and he's engaging more people. But yeah, but at the same time, you you need a balance. I guess right. is what guys have to get to. And you'll see guys dive in and they'll, they'll jump at any, any little sponsorship. Yeah. And it's, you know, they start getting sponsors like, wow, I'm sponsored. And, but eventually it gets to a point where, the, you know, you, when you do have a sponsor, you have a commitment to them and, and you want to grow with that, but you can't if you're stretched too thin. So right. that is a very common transformation. I think guys go through, not everyone, you know, some guys never get to that next level, but a guy from the starting to getting to the top, They certainly all seem to go through that. Right. Interesting. That's very interesting. What do you see under the radar pros doing really well? Not, not our, not the guys we see on TV, but maybe some regional guys or, or guys that are under the radar. What, what what do you see? What do you see them doing well? So it's, it's, it's different, different guys have different uh, directions, I guess, Mm -hmm. whether they're a tournament guy or, Maybe they're a guide. Yeah. Um, both have a lot of value to offer Rapala. Um, I guess one guy, Cody Huff, he just fished in the Bassmaster Classic. He's a college angler, and he's he's got a bright future. Um, a lot of people talk positively about him. He's well-spoken. He's active on social media. He's just being, you know, he's doing a really nice job. Yeah. In, in establishing a, a career as a young college angler. And I see no reason why he won't have a long career in tournament bass fishing. Um, right. He's so a good he's one to watch. Things. Definitely. Definitely. Um, he's been doing a great job, but then a guy that is a really well-known guide um, on a popular fishery is, mm-hmm. is a very valuable guy too. And maybe he is doing YouTube and he's yeah. been in YouTube and is, doing, you know, informational things. He's, he's credible. He's a fishing guide. He has, he puts people on fish for a living. So he's got some information to share and he can help in, in that specific area. Right. He might not have national reach, but, but YouTube's giving guys more of a platform and guys that are doing a really good job with YouTube are growing. I mean, in, right. a, in a big way. Right. And so there's, you can't, you can't ignore that. And there's something, you know, uh, when you when you trust a guy on YouTube, um, I guess it depends on the guy, but uh, there's something a little bit different about it because it feels some, a lot of times it feels very grassroots and it feels very, you know, relative, relevant and authentic. It does. Yeah. A lot of it is fairly raw and there's just guys are more after the quantity over quality yeah. as far as content goes. And right. I've been kind of an old school type of guy where I like the polished product of, you know, the bass content, masters, you mean? Yeah. And fishermen and the lender show, all that good stuff. But I get it that, that it's, that's what's happening. And um, yeah, it's a big deal. There's room for both. We, we need both. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So as there, yeah, there's kind of those two different directions as guys getting into it and um, whether they're tournament anglers or guides or, Maybe they just like to fish tournaments on the weekend. Um, that's a tough, tougher thing to get into, I guess, when you have a day job. And there's yeah. just, there's, it's, a, it's a flooded market. There's a lot of guys that that's like right. fishing bass tournaments and all want to be yeah. superstars, but don't, they can't commit to it. They have families or their job or whatever it is. Right. So that's, that's a little tougher. But a guy that's really committed and is truly a, a professional, you know, they're fishing for a living, whether they're guides or tournaments. Um, there's different things they can do. But what I've noticed is they typically stand out. The really good ones to mm-hmm. me, they're easy to pick out for me. Um, just watching a lot of what's going on out there. It's, it's the good ones stand out. So. How, what do you see? What is, what is it about them that stands out? 
it, it's kind of a gut feeling I get yeah. around guys. Um, yeah. Ultimately, that some you can't ignore. If you just they, you keep hearing about guys, keep right. seeing their names pop up, seeing a cool picture. Um, yeah. Yeah. Certainly, if buzz. it's a guy that just wants to buzz. be on like the Rapala's pro staff, and I, they send me, you know, or sh- share pictures to our social media mm-hmm. channels. Really nice, cool pictures with our products in them. They're going to get my attention really quick. Of course, of course. So that's a good, that's a good segue into if if what's your advice for a young angler who doesn't know anyone, who doesn't have contacts in the fishing industry, and and needs to try to figure out how to build that? How do you do that? It's it's challenging. I think mm-hmm. right now there are more young people trying to get into it, and more people that want to be pro fishermen than ever. Um, the more that are trying to get into it, the harder it is. Um, mm-hmm. For me personally, credibility is really big. Yeah. So I think you need to just go and fish and learn how to fish and become a really good angler at lots of different techniques. And 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 I think it was Mark Zona talked about hitting the steps of a ladder that as you start, start really small, start local bass club and don't get to the next rung of the ladder until you're ready. And don't right. ever think about skipping one. of. If you skip a rung, you will fail. You will fall on your face. It's just how it goes. I totally agree. So many times, but I've got a guy that many of your audience and viewers probably know, Seth Fighter. Well, mm-hmm. Seth lives near me, and I kind of knew of Seth, to, you know, and then he started fishing the opens, but he was a really good fisherman locally. And I just started, you know, giving him a discount on product, give him some product. And then he, he did well, and then he finally qualified for the elites. Um, but he just focused on fishing. He wanted to to hone his craft and his skill set of catching bass. If he can do that well enough, you need to be able to do that well enough to be competitive uh, in a super competitive tournament world. That that has to be your priority, I think. All right, we're going to take a short break and come right back with Dan Quinn from Rapala. I really want to hear from you to know what kind of questions you have and how I can serve you best in this podcast. The easiest place to reach me is probably at Facebook or Instagram, where you can find me as Fishing Business Podcast or on YouTube. But you'll have to search for me there by typing in Fishing Business Podcast. Holla! All right, we've got Dan Quinn from Rapala with us today on the Fishing Business Podcast. Dan is the field promotions manager for Rapala, and that also includes some other brands. I should I was neglectful in not pointing that out. Rapala and VMC, and and what else? Yeah, so VMC owns Rapala, and then underneath VMC and Rapala would be Storm. That's right, Storm. Terminator, uh, Lure Jensen, Suffix fishing wow. line. Um, as a saltwater brand yeah we have we have a very diverse um portfolio and now we are we 49 percent of 13 as well and oh. and as of about a month ago i'm i'm now managing their pro staff as well oh wow that's awesome okay yeah. so what is uh what is one habit in business or in life that you would recommend a beginner in in business uh adopt a beginner in business in general or the no, fishing, fishing business? business or? Fishing business. Let's say fishing business. A habit? Yeah. What is one habit? Like, like I, my, I swear by getting up in the morning and writing out my day of what I have to do and what I want to accomplish and what my large goals are and what my small goals are. That's just one thing for me business-wise that has really helped me. So is there something like that? And like I said, maybe it's not even business. Maybe it's life. Maybe it's, you know, don't go to bed angry or make sure you say your God bless you's every night. But um, <laughs> what is something that, that you as a, as a successful business person could pass on to say, you know, uh, here's a, here's a little tidbit of advice for you i mean maybe it's a little cheesy but the golden rule of treat people how you want to be treated um i love that i have always i just grew up that way with my parents and i teach my kids that and i do that to everyone i meet period doesn't matter um i think if you do that you're if you you know if you're honest to someone they should be honest back to you just you know multiple different scenarios but ultimately do things and treat people how you want them to do things for you and treat you, I guess. I love that. It's simple, but it, it really, it, it, it's appropriate for me. 
Um, yeah. It's worked well. So listen, hey, buddy, it's appropriate for everybody. Who do you recommend we follow if we wanted to learn? If somebody wanted to learn more about marketing in general, not necessarily fishing, but marketing, who do you follow? Who do you look to for uh, new ideas and and inspiration? Oh, that, you know, I may not be the best one for this one. But <laughs> I, I I'm like an unorthodox marketing person. I didn't go to school for marketing. I you just go by just, instinct. I'm, I'm a total fish head. Yeah, I think I have good common sense, a good gut yeah. instinct. So I don't. I guess I'm not all that. <laughs> I maybe my boss shouldn't watch this, but I don't <laughs> follow like some real marketing professionals as much as probably some oh, yeah. people do. That's all right. That's um, all right. That's okay. You don't I have guess, to. For me, I like I like a, to to monitor and look at a broad selection of people and industries. I love hunting, so I mm-hmm. watch I do watch a lot of hunting stuff. I obviously all over the fishing world. Um, yeah, I don't. I guess I don't. Uh, I'm. I guess I'm ultimately a fish bum. And well, I, I love that. I, I think that's good. Okay, what about a business person you admire? A business person I admire, I guess I I can't not say Greg Walner. Yeah. I think Greg is is just a real admirable person. He's he's just super intelligent. He's smart. He's fun. Um, he's just a well rounded, awesome, smart guy that yeah. I really I I've always admired. Agreed. I feel the same. I really do. And I actually admire you too, Dan. And um, I, I do. You. And I I love the way you conduct yourself. I love the way you. Um, you do business and um, I love the way you personify the Rapala brand. And uh, uh, you know, I, I feel I have a lot of love for that brand and I, it's hard. Sometimes I'm not sure if it's, do I, is it, is it the product I love or the people I love or what the brand stands for that I love, but it's a great brand. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm feel really blessed that I know you guys. Well, thank you very much, Angie. I really appreciate that. And likewise, likewise. Okay, I've got a couple of key takeaways from that conversation, and I'm curious if you all share my thoughts. My three favorite quotes. It's all about relationships. Dan said relationships are the foundation of the fishing industry, and I agree with that. But I'm going to take it a step further to say all business is all about relationships. All successful businesses are all about relationships. Think about it. What's your favorite restaurant, your go-to spot? It might not be all about the food. In fact, I bet it's your favorite because the servers are nice to you and the manager might come over to say hello and check on you and somebody says, did you enjoy it? What about your car dealer? The woman that cuts your hair? You make so many choices as a consumer because of relationships. And Dan is saying that he has a true relationship with his pro staff and his pro staff has a relationship with their fans and followers. Take a look at the Rapala Pro Staff and think about whether you feel an affinity for any of those folks. Like you might feel like you know them. So start now, no matter what you aspire to in business, start now building relationships. Okay, number two, people don't wanna be told what to buy. Absolutely, a hard sale usually doesn't work. People wanna be naturally curious about a product or they wanna believe someone when they tell them it's a good product. It's the know, like, and trust factor again, y'all. People need to know you so they can like you, and then they'll trust you. And when they trust you, they'll want to buy from you. And finally, start on the first rung of the ladder and don't think about skipping a rung. Start small. Learn how to fish really well. Start some relationships in your area, in your region, and grow from there. Hone your craft of catching bass, but also hone the craft of marketing which is what we're doing right here. I'm going to close for now. Thanks so much for being here with me. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Let me know your thoughts. Leave me a comment. Come see me on social media. You can find me at Fishing Business Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. I want to serve you. So let me know what you want to hear more of. I'm going to sign off now. The water's calling and I got to go. Signing off the way my favorite fishing show host always signed off. Jerry McKinnis always said he wanted to thank his dad, and me too, because he always had time to take me fishing. Holla!